Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tanya Evans and I'm the CEO of WorkPro. Uh, thank you so much for joining myself and, um, and my colleague uh, and partner, Amy Towers, who is a uh, specialist work health and safety practitioner. Amy and I um, have known each other for about um, 13 years. Um, Amy and I, uh, Amy guides uh, WorkPro in their quest to make sure that um, any work health and safety e-learning uh, that we produce and we offer to our client base is uh, not only practical but is up to date. So her and I have been talking more recently and um, in our quest to make sure that um, work health and safety information is being delivered to you guys in a timely fashion so that you are protected, you're informed and therefore protected. Amy and I figured it was a good time to give uh, a practical update on the work health and safety uh, landscape nationally. Uh, the way the session's going to roll today, we've allowed kind of 45 minutes to an hour. Um, if you have any concerns, um, pop them in the chat. If you have any questions, um, we will come back to those at the end. So we're going to allow kind of 10, 15 minutes at the end to address any of those questions. Uh, we have about 80 people on the line today. So uh, 10 to 15 minutes may or may not be um, enough time to answer any questions that you have, but do feel free to pop them in the chat. We can always come back um, and answer those later and make sure that everyone gets access to those answers. The session is being recorded um, and you will get a copy not of not just of these slides, uh, but also the recording. So if any of your colleagues can't make today's session, uh, please be assured that they will get a copy of this as well. Um, so there is lots going on in the work health and safety landscape. Um, there always is, um, but this timely update today um, is going to address four key areas. So from um, legislative changes, um, there is an OHS amendment bill for Victoria that Amy is going to be uh, speaking about. There is some um, psychological health regs that are coming into place um, and Amy will talk about those. A code of practice in New South Wales um, around managing psychological health at work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some case law that's really important um, as you uh, adopt work health and safety in your organisations and manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so Amy's going to talk about some of the more recent case law and what some of the gaps might have been so that you can adopt those things into your own businesses um, and also uh, the regulators um, and their focus on labour hire in particular. So uh, thank you again so much for joining us and by introduction Amy Towers. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya, and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar today. Um, like Tanya said, a very important update. Um, and it's also uh, part of due diligence. So for, for those of you who are not aware of what due diligence is, obviously um, as a business, the business has a, a health and safety duty to workers. Um, but those at the most senior level, so directors, owners of business and the like, um, are responsible for what the business puts in place in regards to health and safety. And part of fulfilling that due diligence obligation is keeping up to date with health and safety legislation, uh, what's happening with the industry. So it might not be happening within you know, um, your wet workplace yet, uh, but if there's potential risks um, uh, there you need to be aware of what could come your way and be prepared for those things. So accessing these types of updates um, is not only you know generally good for your business in protecting your workers um, but it's also assisting you to meet your primary duty of care and as well as your if you're a senior manager business owner your due diligence obligations it's defined in the Model Work Health and Safety Act due diligence is keeping abreast of health and safety matters, including legislation and the like. So, yeah. thanks we for only joining us. Practical sense, right, Amy? Absolutely. <laughs> no, no great cardigan here. No, that's right. Yeah. So we, we, we'll try and keep it light because uh, obviously health and safety can be uh, not the most exciting topic, but obviously very important. And we'll, we'll keep it in a relaxed style. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, like I said, very relaxed and, and try and explain it in, in really simple terms because that's how I understand it. I have to really break it down and really understand the practicality of it. So I'll, I'll be identifying what the change is or the proposed change. And then I'll also talk about what that looks like for a labour hire business. Sorry. Well done. Thanks, Amy. 
Um, and when I say labour hire, we don't really like using that term labour hire. And as such, we've identified this session as a um, as the work health and safety update for recruitment and staffing firms. So I think staffing firms is probably um, better terminology here because labour hire suggests that it's more sort of industrial type work. Uh, but yeah. here, uh, we're really covering all types of uh, temporary work. Um, so, you know, we're talking about office-based work as well. And that will, um, that will come through um, loud and clear when we get to talking about psychological health. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the first updates uh, that we wanted to give you was around some legislative changes. And um, these legislative changes are happening at the moment. So they haven't been implemented as yet. Uh, but why do you need to know it now? Because it will come into play in the near future. And what that does between now and then, it gives you time to prepare for that and review mm -hmm. your systems. So when I say systems, that's things like, what's your procedure for when you engage with a new client? Um, what's your process uh, for inducting your, your candidates? Uh, what's your process for verifying your host has inducted your candidates? How do you know that yeah. your training is adequate? Uh, are you doing client side assessments? What are the types of questions you're asking there? And is it in line with your legislative obligations? So, yeah. Um, so this, okay, the first change is the OHS Amendment Bill in Victoria. So, uh, just to make it very clear, there's different health and safety law in each state and territory. So each state and territory has its own health and safety law. But when it comes to the staffing, recruitment and staffing industry, the, um, the obligation to ensure the health and safety of um, on hire workers pretty much looks the same across the board. Um, however, there are some differences. So um, everyone, except for Vic and WA, are pretty much operating off the same Health and Safety Act and, and similar regulations. Victoria has their own, WA has their own. But in saying that, WA are looking at and in the process of um, joining the model health and safety law so it aligns with all the other states and territories. So Vic mm -hmm. sort of will stand alone still. Um, but they've just introduced to Parliament, and this was only in June, late June, introduced to Parliament um, this amendment bill. And the purpose of that was to strengthen Victoria's health and safety laws and make Victorian workplaces safer. So the key change to the bill is actually focused on labour hire. Um, and that's why we thought it was important to do this yeah. update. Today. Uh, so what this means is that, uh, and it's very, it's a bit more technical. So we, we uh, um, at RCSA, um, we actually had to meet with WorkSafe to understand what is it exactly that's changing? Because what came out in the media release um, mm -hmm. was a little confusing. So uh, we're gonna set that straight here, what this means for, for your business. Okay. So what that means is that um, essentially in Victoria, there's a duty of the employer to ensure the health and safety of an employee. Now under that main duty of care, that includes on hire workers. So essentially, if you're an on hire firm, you are the employer and your on hire workers are your employees. Under that same section, the host is considered an employer too, and that's why you share that responsibility. And then what we see is if a, a on hire worker is injured at a host workplace, we'll see in most cases, there'll be um, a prosecution involving the host because maybe they failed to um, ensure the health and safety of that on hire worker as their employee. And the same uh, of the, um, both the host and the on hire firm, but they're, they're separate prosecutions because they're, you both deemed the employer and you both share that responsibility. Yeah. So the thing that's actually going to be changing is um, that definition of employee um, 
uh, is going to be extended throughout the rest of the Health and Safety Act in Victoria. And it will sort of more align with the Health and Safety Act in the other states and territories. So what that means in Victoria at the moment, that definition doesn't extend beyond the main primary duty of care. So I'm gonna give an example of that. In Victoria, if you supply an on-hire worker to a host workplace, yes, they have a duty of care to that worker. However, they don't have the full um, scope of responsibility as they do to their own employees in okay. that, um, say, uh, their own, a host direct employee can request to have designated work groups and a health and safety representative structure. And then the host, and then in that case, their employer would have to implement that framework. At the moment in Victoria, an on hire worker at a host workplace doesn't have that ability because they're not considered any, an employee in that part of the legislation. Right. So what it's, it's extending this, this amendment, extends the definition of employer in the other sections of the act, which encourage you know, labour hire or on hire workers, you know, to speak up and to ask for yep. it to be represented at the host workplace. So that's the key change here. Um, so again, it's, it's more of a technicality, but it's important to know that the, your on hire workers, if you're placing in Victoria, will have the same rights and health and safety protections as other workers um, in that they can request those types of structures in at the host workplace. Um, okay. Similarly, um, the host, even though they've got a duty to that employee, at the, that worker at the moment um, to protect them, they don't have ongoing obligations in that they don't have to monitor the worker's health and safety. So that's a separate section of the Act. So that'll ensure that that's covered as well. So again, okay. you know, everyone's probably, well, m most people um, who are on, on the call now are probably already treating and, and expecting that of the host anyway. So that's fine. It's just understanding that that's what this change is going to look like. Yeah. Now, the other change, which will align with uh, more so with the Health and Safety Act and Re uh, Health and Safety Act in the other states, is this OHS Amendment Bill in Victoria will introduce a new duty for both the on hire firm or the staffing recruitment and staffing firm and the host employer. And that new duty, if you're supplying into the other states and territories, you'll already be aware or you should already be aware of this obligation. But there's there will be a duty to consult, cooperate, and coordinate. Uh, between the on hire firm and the host. So that doesn't exist at the moment in Victoria, although it's expected, it's not mm -hmm. a standard duty. So that's now going to be introduced. Okay. Um, so what that means, I'll give an example of that. What that means is if you're, again, you uh, as an on hire firm, a staffing firm, you supply to the host, an incident occurs involving that on hire worker at the host workplace. If you don't work with the host, to identify what caused that incident um, and put assist and work with the host to determine who's going to do what to rectify that um, and ensure that the host is putting controls in place. So consult, cooperate, coordinate who will do what, then you're failing in that new duty. Um, so that, like I said, it already exists in the other acts, but it will be uh, a new duty under the, the Victorian um, OHS yeah. amendment. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's how it's going to directly impact um, on hire recruitment staffing. But we think it's a good thing. Obviously, we think it's a good thing that. Sorry. Consistency. Yeah, consistency, and um, you know, it shouldn't just be limited to the main section of the act, which is to protect the 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 on hire worker generally, it should, you know, that, that definition of employee, including the labour hire worker, should extend throughout the Act. So, um, so we think it's a good change. Okay. Um, the other introduction, um, the other piece, sorry, that's changing is that duty holders under work health and safety laws cannot use insurance or indemnity arrangements to avoid the consequences of 
failing to comply with the law. So again, this is important for on hire firms who are entering into agreements and contracts with clients, um, that there's no provisions in there that indemnify one another or someone, a party, against mm -hmm. a, a, um, a penalties associated with a duty under the Health and Safety Act. So um, what the suggestion is, is that uh, once this law kicks in or even before it does, that you go back and look at all of your existing contracts and agreements and also ensure that there's a process moving forward to ensure that there's no indemnity clauses for us, specifically for um, penalties for failing to meet your duty of care under health and safety law. So again, what would that look like? It might say in a contract, something along the lines that of, you know, the client, your client will indemnify you against, say, yep. if a uh, high worker is seriously injured, you're prosecuted yep. by WorkSafe Victoria, they'll cover the cost of that, you know, $100,000 fine that you receive. So that's an example of, um, you, you, that's a prohibition, you won't be able to have that in your contracts um, mm. and even your client contract you're not allowed to enter into that because you're also then breaching that section of the act once it's introduced yeah right yeah okay yeah. And, and is there any kind of time frame amy about the introduction of this amendment um so we should see this sometime oh well it, it'll be discussed again um in parliament in august so we don't know yet, but um, it will be sometime in, within the next, say, six months or so. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, Thank but you. We, we uh, obviously, you know, um, particularly through RCSA and the updates, um, we'll, we'll keep everyone up to date with, you know, when that's likely to come through. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got an opportunity now to, to do a bit of an audit and go through yeah. your, your previous contracts and see what's what. Yeah. Um, some other, and I'll just briefly touch on these, some other changes that will be introduced um, is that say if you've got a WorkSafe inspector who attends your workplace or if they attend your host mm -hmm. client's workplace, then now they will be allowed to deliver notices rather than having to deliver it, you know, as a hard copy. They'll be able to deliver notices, reports and infringement notices electronically. Also union authorised representatives of employee organisations, so unions and um, health and safety reps will be allowed to take photos, measurements, make sketches and recordings to assist them in exercising their powers in the workplace. So just a few other changes there, which right. giving... Um, and it, and um, is that hasn't... Has that not been allowed previously or or currently? Um, so that um, t they are able to take notes um, and and things like that, um, but to take photos, measurements, make sketches, they're more the powers of a WorkSafe inspector. So mm. um, WorkSafe can do that, but now there'll be an introduction um, of these powers for union representatives and health and safety. Right, okay. Hmm. Okay. Mm. Um, the next one. <laughs> this is uh, an interesting one um, and uh, concerning for some. And the reason I say concerning is because um, uh, I've been involved in a number of industry discussions um, with WorkSafe. Uh, who are at the moment consulting with industry about the proposed regulations and what that means, um, what it's going to look like. So we don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. Um, right. This is the process that they go through. So they mm -hmm. say, we're thinking about, you know, these options, what do industry think? And so that's the process that we're going through right now. Now, right. the reason they're confusing is because Identifying a physical hazard is pretty yeah. easy. Yeah. Like you can walk into a work site and you can look around and you can go, okay, um, that person's pouring chemical there and they're not wearing protection and, you know, there's not an automated system there, so there's a risk that's going to splash onto them and burn them. Yeah. Um, same with forklift activity. You can walk into a yeah. warehouse. There might not be any bollards or alert system to say, you know, this is crossing over now. Um, so 
there it's a bit easier to identify physical hazards what yeah what these proposed regulations um, are going to mean for and this is not just for Victoria this is across the board so yeah. we're looking at all states and territories that this has been um, suggested recommended Victoria the first one the first state to kick off the the proposed regulation so they're the ones that have started the consultation process we'll okay. see that probably um, in the very near future with the other states and territories um, so this was a recommendation um, that came out um, that uh, we had commitment um, well there was a vote um, from each of the federal state and territory ministers um, that voted to amend the the work health and safety regulations and obviously also victoria wa who's also um, in the process of uh, adopting model laws as well has also committed yeah. to, to um so basically what this means is that at the moment the term work health and safety or occupational health and safety the term health includes psychological health yeah. Yeah. and physical um, yep. So you've still already got a general duty of care to ensure the psychological health of workers. What these proposed re psychological regulations will do is to impose a positive obligation on businesses to manage and guard against the risk of what we call psychosocial hazards in the workplace. Yep. And Tanya, you're probably aware of, of that term, psychosocial hazards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a new term. So that's something that's even being discussed at the moment. Yeah. Should we be, people know what psychosocial hazards is or should we call them psychological hazards? So there's yeah. debate on those things. Okay. Um, okay. Now, the confusion bit comes in because how is an employer, an on-hire firm and even a host, how are you expected to identify mm. psychological risks? Because there's so many things that come under that banner. Yeah. So, and the one thing um, that comes to mind for me is that you you're not you don't actually you don't supervise that person on a day to day basis. They're actually at a host organisation under the supervision, you yeah. know, of someone else. Yeah. So these mm. regulations, which will be law, will prescribe the process that you need to go through to identify, mm -hmm. control and review those risk control measures. So like they say the regulations at the moment, you'll open up the regs, there'll be mm. a section on confined spaces and it tells you how you identify and you need to control those yep. hazards. Same with working at heights. The regulations will identify psychosocial hazards or hazards that uh, present risk to psychological health. And it won't, it's unlikely that it's gonna list all of the different types of psychosocial hazards. So what that means, it's open, to the employer mm. to go, what are all of the potential psychological risks that our workers can be exposed to? Mm -hmm. And are we doing enough to manage that? Sure. Now this, like you said, it gets tricky because it might be a bit easy if you've got direct control. And this applies for recruitment and staffing firms to their, their own direct employees, yeah. in the office, yeah. you know? So you've got to address that. But then how do you ensure that you're going to mm. be fulfill your positive duty when you're checking yeah. your client systems. Yeah. So if you're doing yeah. a site assessment before you place your workers with the host, you're going to have to start thinking about for say if you're supplying uh say you're supplying uh, professional workers in the professional services sector, mm -hmm. potentially high risk for psychosocial hazards. Sure. You know, long working hours, high job demand, um, yep. number of things. It could it be workplace culture, workplace relationships. They could all, all be factors there that may be high risk for professional services. So you might be an accountant, lawyer, those types of things. So what are you asking of your client? What systems do you expect your client to have in place to protect that worker against psychosocial mm -hmm. hazards? So because the list is so long, um, it's going to be a tricky one and people are worried yeah. about it. Employees are yeah. worried about fulfilling that obligation. Again, we've still have, got the have, Sorry, have the regulators given you in your discussions with WorkSafe as an example, have they, have they given any, any um, examples or, or 
practical detail around how that could potentially work? Um, so they, they give some options. Um, they, they've given options about what it could look like. So they suggest things like, um, should we be um, introducing a hierarchy of control like we do now for physical hazards? You know, should we should we set out what that risk management process looks like? Should we make a risk assessment mandatory again? And we were all like, no, wow. risk assessment no. should be mandatory. Um, yeah. So identify yes and put yes. controls in place yet, yes, but to do a risk assessment on every psychosocial hazard using a prescribed form, we are the industry are against um, mm. because it. It's more red tape, and it's and and are we really going to? Um, we need to focus on the control, not 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 the. We need to consider risk, but we need to focus on the control. So, this mm. is going to be a very interesting process that we go through, and it'll be interesting to see what they come out with. Now, the other frustrating part here for businesses, particularly those that. Um, uh, supply workers or across you know different states and territories in Australia mm. Mm. remember that each state and territory will be introducing their own psychological regulation so Victoria's process what's prescribed in their regulations might look different and will probably look different to what New South Wales has um, oh, so, <laughs> so that, that's again, we don't know what it's exactly going to look like now, um, but you know, obviously, you know, keep an eye for, out for updates yep. um, on that. But it is coming. Yeah. Um, okay. Victoria, for example, <laughs> are looking to their their timeline. So, like I said, they're in the consultation period now. They've got a regul yep. regulatory impact statement out. Um, I think Deloitte prepared that. Um, and they're looking at implementation around Feb 2022. So okay. um, there's guidance material out at the moment um, because, again, everyone's still got that obligation to ensure the psychological health of workers. It just means these regulations will, will give a bit more prescription on the process okay. that you need. Yeah. To okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so when they come out, what my suggestion would be is that that will be the time where you go, okay, are we in our systems, in our way that we're dealing with our clients and managing the health and safety of our workers, mm -hmm. are we following that process to manage psychological risk? Yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. Hard to yeah, I, I feel it. I feel like WorkPro is about to do an e-learning module leading up to February 2022, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Just on psychosocial risk. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll work I mean, with you on that. But WorkPro, I mean, those modules uh, already introduce stress. Yeah. Uh, it looks yeah. at you know, behavioural matters in the workplace. So, again, yeah, we psychosocial hazards, all those things that can impact the psychological health of a worker. It could be yeah. bullying, harassment, sexual harassment. There's a big focus on sexual harassment at the moment too, yeah. obviously. Um, it could be fatigue. Um, and yep. so all of those things are already incorporated. It's just we need to understand it better and we need yep. to be more aware of what's expected of us as a business to fulfil that positive obligation. So an example yep. of that is don't just say, oh, we'll give people an employee assistance program and that's how we're managing psychological health. It's preventing yep. those things from happening. And EAPs are part of that in the yep. response and support, but it's what are the you're doing to prevent those things from happening. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's enough on <laughs> that. That'll be a heavy topic. Watch this space. Yeah, watch, watch this space. It's huge. Uh, it's huge. Um, and, you know, there's tools available now. Um, there's a tool called People at Work, which WorkSafe, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland developed, and now the other states and territories have sort of collaborated and are now promoting right. it tool right so if you have more okay. than 20 piece, uh, people within your business they recommend you mm -hmm. use that tool and that people at work tool um, you can do it internally or you can engage someone to assist you in doing it. it's like an audit okay. and run surveys and you identify where your psychosocial risks are and then it guides you through well how do you manage those things in the workplace so okay. there's some free tools already available to us which yep. is fantastic so you can jump yep. on and, and use that and it's a digital process too okay 
Okay. Another one focusing on psychological health at work. Um, so this is a code of practice. Mm -hmm. um, so for those that aren't aware how our legislation works, our framework is we've got an act that tells us who has duties. We've got regulations that give us more prescription. So again, we'll see psychological health and tell us how, how we manage that. Mm -hmm. And then we have codes of practice that tell us in a practical way how we meet those obligations under the Act and the regulation. Now, New South Wales is the first state in Australia to introduce a, a specific code of practice on managing psychological health in the workplace. So this was only introduced here. Mm -hmm. uh, and what this code is, is, sorry, I'm just flicking around here. Um, so it was only introduced in May this year and it's for employers, so uh, on hire firms, so recruitment and staffing yep. firms, their host employer and the host employers. Anyone who's got a duty under the Act, who owes a duty to a worker, mm -hmm. if, and if you're in New South Wales, supplying workers in, in New South Wales, you need to read that code of practice. Um, and why I say you need to read it? Because it gives you practical guidance on how you meet your general duty of care. So the Act says, you have a primary duty of care to ensure the health and safety of workers that you engage or cause to engage. Yeah. And, so, and health includes psychological health. So how do we fulfill that? We need to go yep. to that code to understand mm -hmm. what that looks like. It gives some fantastic, I've given a link there so that when we share the slides, you can jump straight to it. Yeah, but beautiful. what it's at the end, and I always love jumping to the end because that's where all the templates and the examples yep. are. They've got a case study for retail, um, for construction, for and so what they do, they set it out um, in a table. What was the issue? What did they do to it? What was the risk? What did they do yep. in practice to address it? So it gives you right. good examples on what's expected there. So I would encourage yep. everyone, uh, and, and psychosocial hazards is, um, you know, it, it's common to all workplaces. Um, mm -hmm. So every business should be looking at that code and understanding yeah. what's expected. Now, it doesn't, the code of practice doesn't introduce a new duty. It just tells you practically yeah. how you can do your general duty. Um, so it's good to, to check that one out. Yeah. Okay, um, case law. So um, this case law is obviously what I've done is I've picked out two case studies, um, yep. two recent prosecutions. Now there's been six that I did a quick count of. There could be more. There's been right. six in the past 11 months. Right. Uh, in the labour hire sector. Right. So six labour hire firm related health and safety prosecutions that have occurred mm -hmm. because that labour hire or on hire worker has been injured at a host site. Okay. And is this the more recent focus on labour hire, Amy, or is this just is this just a spike that you've seen or an increase that you've seen more recently? Um, I mean, we've, you know, it's not uncommon for a labour hire firm to be prosecuted. Um, mm. But I, I, I'd have to compare it to other years. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure that there's a significant increase. Um, okay. But it does seem a lot for a, an 11 month period for six yeah. labour hire firms to be prosecuted, with most of those happening in Victoria. Um, and I know a couple are underway in South Australia and New South Wales as well. So they right. take a couple of years to get through the court system. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you'll see with the two case studies I'm about to show you that they happened some years before, but have been the decisions being made, you know, this year. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. So the six that I've mentioned, sorry, five of those were prosecutions. So that's where the labour hire firm was taken to court. They identified yep. where they were doing their duty of care and then fined them. Mm -hmm. the, sixth, the sixth sixth, one was an enforceable undertaking. So that's an alternative okay. to prosecution. So the yep. labour hire requested instead of being prosecuted can we spend a certain amount of money and, and put it reinvested into health and safety and then that's it determined accepted by the regulator so that was okay. a safe 
North Wales one. So I love case law as a learning tool. I don't love case law, but I love it as a learning tool. And I think yeah, sure. everyone that's on the line here today, if you're not monitoring case law, you're missing out on a huge learning opportunity. So monitor case law um, yep. at, for labour hire and also for the in, even though it might be a, a direct employer that's been prosecuted, it hasn't been a labour hire arrangement. If it's the if it's within the industry that you place in, say construction or agriculture, focus on that because that tells you where potentially your host is exposing both you and themselves to to risk as well. So yep. to monitor. Uh, case law, super easy. You can jump on, say, WorkSafe Victoria, jump onto WorkSafe Victoria. There's a section on prosecutions. It gives you a list of all of the businesses that have been prosecuted or their enforceable undertakings for each year. You can do that with every state and territory. Jump on to Safe Work South Australia or WorkSafe Tassie and you can get that Is it information. Going, yeah, but does it take a month of Sundays to read through the, the case? No, because they just give a little <laughs> summary. It's just a... Uh, okay, and then sometimes you can go and search for the full case. That yeah. might take a while to read through. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Uh, but the summaries are awesome. Like it just yeah, gives okay. you a paragraph. And so yeah. um, I think that's really important. As well, uh, I said at the start of this webinar that business owners, those in a senior management role, they've got a due diligence obligation, which is to keep abreast of what's happening, not yeah. just within business but within the industry so yep. case law should be reported at senior management meetings this is what's happening within our space are we doing all of these things to prevent that from happening to us yeah yeah good one so I'm just going to briefly touch on these but it, it, it really highlights each case law really highlights um, uh, and reinforces what a, a recruitment and staffing firm should be doing. And like I said, we can learn a lot from that. We can just do a, a quick analysis and say, are we doing that? Yes or no, what do we need to improve on? So this particular case um, was an incident occurred in December, 2018, where an on hire worker was operating an unguarded vegetable dicer and his hand got sucked up in the, so what he was doing, he was feeding the dicer from the bottom at the chute and his hand became caught in the back of the chute and it took a couple of hours uh, for the Melbourne Fire Brigade to release um, his mm -hmm. hand from that machinery. I didn't go into the details because they're quite mm -hmm. awful. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, as a result, um, the labour hire firm were, um, there was obviously enough evidence to demonstrate that they had failed in their duty of care under the Occupational Health and Safety Act in Victoria. Specifically, so under the section of the Act that they were, um, that they failed, it identifies, it identifies a number of things that you should be doing. And in this particular case, it said that the labour hire firm failed to provide a safe system of work. And I'll talk about what that is in the next part. But uh, in April this year, so again, Obviously, there's an investigation and it was taken to court. Then this year, that staffing firm was fined $20,000. And so this has got nothing to do with workers' compensation or, um, you know, common law mm. costs. Like this is purely for not being proactive and putting systems in place to check that the host workplace was safe. Um, so $20,000 yeah. plus costs. Okay, so the failures, this case identified that this labour hire firm didn't attend the workplace at regular intervals to identify the risk to health and safety. So what that means is that, what that tells us is that if you're a labour hire firm, you should be assessing your client's systems and possibly doing a workplace visit to make sure that that workplace is safe before you even place there. Now it's not mm -hmm. enough just do that once you need to think about how we're we going to because that work is going to be placed there throughout a know, period of time yeah. Yeah. you your duty doesn't stop at that point that you place them it goes to the very end um, yeah. of, of the day that they finish so what checks are you doing to ensure that there's uh, their health and safety is protected throughout their placement so that labor high firm didn't do those things mm -hmm. there was no record of actions and we see this is 
common failure for labour hire firms might be the recruitment consultant or someone else within the business is given a checklist or may not even be given a checklist they go out and do a bit of a tick and flick and so that doesn't satisfy your duty so you need to think about how do we train our consultants and our people in that tool so that they understand they feel confident they know how to identify those hazards when they go out there and if there's something that's not right there should be an action that then yep. you then to your client. So they've identified that the labour hire firm didn't do that. They didn't identify actions that mm -hmm. were then shared with the client. And this is an example of that new duty in Victoria, which already exists in the other states, except for WA, consult, cooperate, oh. coordinate. So yeah. you identify a hazard at your client's site. You then need to identify what you think needs to be put in place, consult, cooperate and coordinate with them. Yeah. Okay. Um, they didn't consult with the host on those actions. They didn't monitor the nature of the work to be performed by the worker. So what that tells us is that they placed the worker, they may have known what the worker was going to be doing at the beginning, um, but they didn't regularly check in with the worker and monitor that to make sure that their work tasks didn't change, that the equipment that yeah. they were operating was safe. So again, there was not that system. This is what we call a system of work. And they didn't consult yep. with workers. So that's something we always encourage on hire firms to do. Again, don't just do all the activity up front and once they're placed, it's you know, hands off. Regularly consult with the worker, ask them questions. Are you doing anything different to what was originally agreed to? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are your concerns? Are there any concerns about health and safety? Have you been instructed and trained on how to do that task safely? Um, and they're, all, they're, they're always indicators of whether things are being done right or not. Yeah. Um, and just as an FYI here, because people are, are, are commonly asked, well, what about the host? So separately, so the on hire firm failed in their duty of care, um, but separately the host was also identified as failing in their duty of care to the worker too, and in a separate case they were fined $90,000 plus. I yeah. think it was around thousand in costs um, for failure to provide information about hazards associated with the DISA. They didn't document and instruct the worker on a safe operating procedure on how to safely operate that piece of machinery. And there was a lack of adequate information and training on that safe operating procedure and presented in a way that that person would understand. I think there was a language barrier there too. So that's a consideration. So that's the first case. The second case doesn't give us a lot of information about where the specific failures were. Um, mm -hmm. Another one that happened in 2018, an on-hire worker, this was a case, an interesting case, because it said um, the on-hire the on firm had specifically stated to the host that they weren't to change the workers' duties without notifying them. Yep. But it wasn't enough just to state that. You need to show that you've got a system of work where you, like I said, you might monitor the workplace, you do regular check-ins and make sure that there haven't been assigned other work. So just yeah. saying, oh, let us know if something changes, that's not enough. So yeah. the on hire was um, the host assigned the worker to another part of the workplace, which the on hire firm didn't know about. They were doing an activity around a piece of machinery, which was called the moulding machine at a timber manufacturing plant. And mm -hmm. again, I forgot the details of the incident because it's horrific, but the worker died um, as a result of those multiple injuries involving the heavy machinery. Um, yeah. Labour hire firm um, was deemed to have failed to provide a safe system of work and fail failure to provide a maintained plant. And the case said that whilst the labour hire firm is not expected to be an expert in how the plant operates and the ins and outs of it. They still need to have a system in place to check that the host is doing the right things to ensure that that plant and equipment is for the person to operate. So what yeah. we would generally ask is, you know, have you done plant risk assessments? Um, is there adequate guarding in place? What equipment is the worker going to be working on? We need to ask those things through the job order form, or the job order process and document that. And we need to ask it through um, the client assessment process and regularly check in with the worker and site visits where possible. Yeah, I was going to say um, education for the worker as well um, to understand yeah. that. Because I'm sure that as a worker, you'd feel uncomfortable you know, if you're being placed at a site and you're being asked, listen, do you know what? We're really busy. I really need you to go over here on this machine. 
yes. you know, that they need to understand what their roles as a worker is as well. Um, so informing them, educating them, um, and, and having that relationship with their supervisor yeah. and recruitment consultant are all really important to prevent these injuries. So where we've got, you know, duty, and you can see in these cases, there was a duty to provide safe systems of work, and we've seen in both of these cases they didn't. Um, yeah. There's also under the general duty to provide adequate informa information, instruction, training, and supervision. And um, so yeah. the part that you're talking about there is both the on-hire firm's got a duty to do that. So that's where the induction yeah. comes, induction and information on worker rights and responsibilities and giving them information yeah. about the typical hazards that they could face at the client site. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when to speak up, um, their job order, you know, assignment summary confirmation, should identify who do they report to, how do they raise health and safety issues, what can and can't they do, but more importantly, what can they do? They seize work mm -hmm. if it's unsafe, say no to unsafe work. So that's that should be through the induction that you're giving that information and the host should be giving the same information to them. You need to verify that the host is giving them that information. So it's yeah, really, sure. yeah. So in this case here, um, this staffing firm was fined $50,000 plus $10,000 in costs. The comments, mm -hmm. again, they didn't go into the details of what they didn't do, but it said that the staffing firm should have done more to assess the risks at the workplace. So that suggests that, uh, again, not enough was done to assess the client's workplace and determine whether it was a, a safe workplace to work. Um, and yeah. then a comment made by Julie Nelson, for, who's the WorkSafe Executive Director. Um, she said that labour hire agencies in this case not only need to establish if a workplace is safe in the work in, in the first place, they must continue to monitor their employee and consult with them on health and safety matters relevant to their job. It includes making sure the host does yeah. not give their employees new or different tasks, especially tasks unrelated to their experience and qualifications. Again, we often see that the case in these prosecutions is there's been a change in the scope of work and in the work yeah. that adequately yeah. trained. So you need to be doing more to try and keep on top of that. Yeah, it comes back to that the three C's that we spoke of earlier, the communication, consultation, collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the regulators, we're going to stop shortly for some questions, but just quickly, the regulators focus on labour hire. Um, obviously, all regulators care about labour hire, um, but two regulators who, have, who over the last two plus years have had a specific focus on labour hire, a Safe Work New South Wales and WorkSafe Victoria and RCSA has been heavily involved in consultation with them about their strategies. Um, Safe Work, I've just got it on the screen. This was a survey that Safe Work New South Wales did about two and a half years ago that identified the high risk factors for labour hire. Um, so I won't read them out, but that's why they think that labour hire is an at risk worker group. Um, in the mix with that is so labour hire, um, young workers, um, culturally and linguistically diverse workers and migrant workers. So there's four groups that are included in that at-risk worker group, but this is Safe Work New South Wales focus um, and they want to address each of these high risk factors throughout their strategy um, from 2018 to 2022. So that's what they're focusing on. So what we're going to see very soon from Safe Work New South Wales is a, a whole new toolkit for labour hire. So it'll give us guidance material, templates, um, so on and so forth. So again, once that's produced, which will be very, very soon, within the next few months, we suspect, um, that will be issued out to our CSA members and keep an mm -hmm. eye out, subscribe to Safe Work New South Wales so you can receive that or check their website regularly. Um, but that's when you'll need to then review your own systems against the, that guidance material and say, is there anything more we can be doing here? Yeah, I know from time to time, Amy, we do get asked, and it's actually, it's probably more rare than what I thought it would be, uh, but from time to time, we do get asked about uh, WorkPro's e-learning material and our modules and whether we um, are going to present those in um, English uh, languages other than English. Uh -huh. um, and I know that you and I have spoken about this quite a bit um, and, and, and spoken to the safety authorities about it. And the reality is that if someone is, usually if they're going onto site, 
So um, our the WorkPro's e-learning is one part of getting someone safe and ready for work. Um, our content is written at a really basic um, level. And then the reality is going on to site and that the um, signage, um, discussions, communication and training is generally also delivered in English. What Do you have a view of what, um, what you've just spoken about, particularly in New South Wales, what that might look like and what those expectations might be? Yeah, so the obligation, there is an obligation that exists that we provide information to workers in a way that they understand it. So you might have it in English, but we need to work out is that the best way of delivering it so how mm. some, some um, on hire firms might manage that so they might identify that that person prefers uh they might not be able to read and and really understand um english that well but if you talk to them at the same time mm -hmm. talk them through it um mm -hmm. that might them so there's lots of different ways that you can go about it but they could, it could even it's not not only you know um language spoken but um it could be you know um sight or hearing um so you've got to consider those yeah. factors so you might give them the they might understand most of the induction that's presented in english but you might also need to give them some additional information in other ways so visuals um you know posters yeah. Or you need to work that out yeah it's really it's a really tough one it's a really really yeah. tough one because you could have lots of different uh oh, language different yeah yeah but there's a number of prosecutions for the host um where we have like the one i just identified where the host hasn't considered the language so safe operating procedures absolutely need to be if the person's if if they don't understand english or it's not their preferred language a safe operating procedure tells them how to do the task safely and the instruction needs to happen so if you know that your worker doesn't speak english or has difficulties understanding it then the, you would expect that the host um has that in place in the preferred language yeah. and if you don't there's a significant risk there there was a, an example of a worker on high worker working at the host site and asked his supervisor to translate um, the safe operating procedure and the supervisor gave him a translator document or um, link on a website and said translate it yourself and he ended up falling into a bath of caustic soda and sustaining very severe injuries. So oh, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's an extreme example, but that just shows how important it is. Um, just on the screen there, again, very quickly, um, this is work, our Safe Work New South Wales, what, what they think success will look like um, through their strategy. So they want to see that workers engaged in labour hire, their hosts, employees and agencies have an increased knowledge um, in their work health and safety rights and obligations. So again, through your induction process, um, through consultation with workers, we should be reminding of them what their health and safety rights and obligations are. That host employees and agencies have an increased understanding of how to manage work health and safety issues faced by workers. Workers engaged in labour hire, their host employees and agencies know where to access work health and safety information. And that the community um, and industry understands the changing work environment, the impacts on, on workers engaged in labour hire. So they think that that's what success will look like through a focus right. on safety through labour hire um, and we've yep. got the same work, work safe Victoria they've identified those four groups but they call them vulnerable workers and they're doing very similar work so um, yep. work safe Victoria last year updated their labour hire guidance material and you can find it on their mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. uh, just lastly before we open it up for any questions if anyone's got any questions yep. where do you find There's actually two here Amy so you know okay there is actually okay. a couple of questions. Okay so um just to finish off, um, there's, like I said, Safe Work New South Wales is about to produce a, a whole new toolkit, which um, RCSA will absolutely share when it becomes available. Um, WorkSafe Victoria, check out their labour hire page. Uh, and we've also got Safe Work New South Wales who recently updated their labour hire guide um, that tells you Again, guidance material, what you should be doing, what your host should be doing, and that can be really helpful in determining what your systems look like. So that's a good check against that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the update. <laughs> that's the summary. There's a like I said, there's a lot happening. Um, yeah, there is a lot happening. 
the process. But yeah. Any questions at all? That's, that's just, and that's just on top of business as usual and, and trying to manage COVID situations. So then like this. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. Danny here from yeah. RCSA. I'm just going to jump in real quick to say thank you, Amy and Tanya, and special thank you to WorkPro. And thank you all once again for joining us. If you do have questions, now is the time to pose these. So please use your chat box to communicate with Tanya and Amy so we can get as many questions in before 2 p.m. Thank you. Yeah. Over to you, Tanya. Yeah, no problems. Um, so, Amy, there is a couple of questions here. Um, Gemma, thanks so much. Um, Gemma's question is around the shared duty of care between um, client at client site as a mm -hmm. as a host. Um, so they have general expertise um, and industry knowledge in terms of the specific hazard. But as recruiters, um, mm -hmm. what is their responsibility, or where does that responsibility lie in terms of identifying hazards and knowing and recommending appropriate controls when they're not industry experts or qualified safety consultants? You would, you would get this question all the time. All the time, and I think it's a good one. Um, so there's no, there's no guidance material as such that says in the recruitment staffing sector, this is the type of training that you need to go and do those assessments, right? However, you need to, the, the on-high firm needs to ensure that the people that they're tasking these activities with to go out and identify hazards, have a level of knowledge that they can identify that we've seen it in a recent case prosecution where the labor hire firm sent the recruitment consultant out they assessed the site as safe but it wasn't um, and they identified in the case that they hadn't the labor hire firm hadn't trained their worker in how to use the tool so how to use the checklist and they hadn't trained them in how to identify hazards so what that tells us is that if a labour hire firm is going to get their recruitment team to do it, you're not expected to be experts as such, but you do need to know how to identify hazards, the legal framework, where to go to find that information. So for example, if I go and do an audit myself, if I go out to a client site today, um, I don't just make recommendations based on what I think. So if you think that something's not right, um, and you should have had some level of training provided to you by your on-hire firm, um, then you don't have to give a recommendation on the spot. You can always come back, you go to regulator guidance material, that it might be fatigue. Okay, so what's the regulator's guidance on fatigue? You can easily find that. So you go to WorkSafe Queensland or whatever state it is, and you look up fatigue and they'll tell you what control should be in place. And you should always be using the regulator's recommendations, not your own, if that makes sense. So what we would say is, you know, we feel like they're not managing fatigue. We feel like you're not managing fatigue properly. You don't have anything in place. We would expect that you do that before we place the worker. Um, and this is what the guidance mentioned, and you can give them a link to that, and that's up to them to then work out how they do it. You don't have to instruct them on exactly what they need to do, but you identify that that's a risk, and you can lead them in the right direction as to what they need to consider, and then you determine whether that's adequate or not. Yeah, I, I could imagine that would be quite a tricky situation, um, Gemma. So. Um, yeah, I wish you all the best of luck with that because I could imagine you—you know—you've got the—you've got a fantastic worker or a bunch of workers that you're trying to place at a host. You've done the right thing. You've got your checks and balances in place. You've had conversations with the host organisation about their responsibility and, you know, the shared duty, and you've both agreed to that. But I could imagine that's a very sensitive situation um, to be in and a conversation to have. Yes. Right, Amy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that we do have another couple of questions. Uh, Alex, Alexandra, thanks so much. Um, what's considered regular check-ins at a host site, Amy? Good question. So your duty is so far as reasonably practicable. There is no defined intervals for doing those regular check-ins. What it is, it's based on risk. So when I say reasonably practical, there's a bit of a test there. So your procedure on how you do these checks should identify how often. Now, um, when I say based on risk, there's a couple of ways you can go about it. You can either set a minimum time frame. So you might say, we've assessed the time, we've identified you know, the risk for the industries that we supply to. So maybe you supply to, um, let's say, just the white collar industry. So you might say, we think, um, you know, 
more of the physical hazards which would go and do a site visit for a low risk aware that psychological risks are maybe higher but we feel that once we do one we might review that annually and we think that's enough based on okay. the low right but then you might say but we also supply to construction so we're going to have a different process for construction we sure. think there are higher risks, so we think that we need to probably go on to site monthly or free monthly you need to make the decision based on risk your process always needs to reflect the risk now then if you get indication that there's something happening on site you might increase that site visit until you're comfortable that that's now resolved so you might go from six monthly up to monthly and then back down to six monthly um, so it really just depends, but it should be based on risk and you need to make that decision as a business and have a good argument as to why you thought that that was a reasonable time frame based on risk. And, and have it documented. Yes. Make sure everything is documented. Yeah. Um, another uh, question by Tanya. Um, what about the employees that are working from home? Yes. Uh, so same. So their home is their workplace. and. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if they're your direct employees, then you need to have a system of work to ensure that their home is safe for them to work. Um, and if your client is allowing them to work from home, when you're doing your whole safety check with your client, you ask the client, will workers be working from home? If so, do you have a working from home process? What does that look like? And then the same, like you would monitor the worker at the client site, you're regularly yep. checking in that worker throughout their placement to ensure that, you know, everything's okay, nothing's changed. Um, and this is probably where you need to ramp up more of the mental health check-in as well, the psychological risk if they're working alone. So, um, yeah, yeah, I hope that can more. I, I know that, Amy, when, um, when, when COVID was about April last year, you and I sat down and wrote uh, a module, an e-learning module, which I think has been completed by some ridiculous amount. It's been like 46,000 people have completed WorkPros working from home module and the checklist that you put together for us. So for anyone yeah. out there that's uh, not currently using WorkPro, that's actually been offered for free for the last, um, really since, since this um, pandemic commenced. So if you're interested in that, um, we do have a learning module plus a checklist, which will be a good start for you. Um, the next question, oh, thanks, Kate. Uh, it's actually just a statement, Amy, saying probably the most informative webinar I've sat in on a long time. Thanks so much, ladies. Thanks, Kate. Oh, great. That's Thank lovely. You. Uh, and another question uh, from Tanya again. Is a labour hire business covered if the client offers to complete the OH&S assessment on your behalf and sign it? No, oh, said no. it needs to yeah. be your assessment. So the client has an obligation and you have the obligation separately, but you share the duty to the worker. So um, in short, you can get them to do that, but if they haven't answered it correctly, it then will fall back on you. Right? You need to verify that they could say, yes, we've got all those things, but when it comes down to it, if it's challenged, how do you demonstrate that you verify that those things existed? You can't, and so you haven't then fulfilled that duty. Yeah. So you can get yeah. them to do it and then send maybe through some documentation to say, here's our policies, and you can do it that way, do a double check. But you also need to think about whether you should be doing site visits, because as a blanket approach, the regulators do expect site visits, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, a final one uh, from Ken. Um, what about the trouble between multiple sites? going from home to Bendigo in this in this case or from home to the from home or from office to the country and the extended hours due to driving how is that covered it would come under fatigue right yeah so I'm not sure if the question's more related to what the labor hire firm should be doing or the business should be doing to ensure the safety of that person through that time or whether that's a covered as in a workers comp cover I'm not sure, I can't answer the workers' comp piece because that's not my expertise. Um, but in relation to systems of work, you've got an obligation to identify that fatigue risk. I actually was working with a client recently on that. Um, they, the client changed the scope of work for these workers and they'd have to be um, driving uh, ridiculous hours to get home from that site. 
um, without any accommodation being, so the accommodation was being taken away so they couldn't drive the next day. And so the labour hire firm did a risk assessment. So I encouraged them to do a risk assessment. We looked at a number of things and then they were going to consult, cooperate and coordinate with the client on that saying, this is too risky. Here's the guidance from the regulator around fatigue. We need to at least give them some accommodation to, to reduce that risk. So, yeah. Hopefully, Ken, that answered your question, but but if not, um, please, you know, reach out to the RCSA or Amy directly um, if she can be of further assistance to answer that. Um, that wraps up the questions, Amy. Um, that were, they were great. They were good questions too. Thank you so That's much, good. everyone. Yeah, well, thank you, Tanya. Um, it's, uh, it's, like you said, it's very timely. There is a lot happening in this space. And I think it's also, yeah. I know we're over time, but very, very quickly, if you've got a labour hire licence, so if you're operating in any of the jurisdictions um, that you require labour hire licence, remember that you've also signed a declaration that you're fulfilling your work health and safety obligations. So if you're not doing those things, you're not only at risk of your, uh, you know, uh, breaching the health and safety health duty, you're at risk yeah. of you know, losing your labour hire licence or, you know, getting it suspended or cancelled yep. if yep. if someone jobs on you or it's investigated in any way, shape or form. So it also impacts on that. Yep. I think it's really important for people yep. to be aware of that. So. As we said, as we said at the start, by Amy, the, the the whole common sense approach. It is, you know, this is what we advocate for. You and I, we advocate for, you know, common sense approaches to work health and safety. Not, you know, yes, there's regulations, yes, there's codes of practice, and and guidance. But um, the reality is that you do have a duty. You know, that you have a duty, and it's being able to fulfil that, but in a really practical uh, way. So, um, thank you so much for the update. That's been really informative. No problem. Thanks everyone for joining. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Afsi. Bye. Bye.